my message is going to be very practical to kick off the new year. It's not going to be ultra spiritual, but I assure you that if you apply the principles that we'll be talking about today during the course of 2019, your life will change. God will supercharge your faith. It'll help take you to the next level. I don't know how you walked in here today. If you're at a place where that's the story of your life, you're fired up, you're excited, you're spiritually fit, you're physically fit, you're ready to take on the day. Or if you walked in here and you're a bit burned out, anybody in that state today, you're just getting by, you're barely making it, you're in need of a recharge or a reboot. This message is particularly for you. Let's go ahead and pray and get into God's word. Lord, we thank you and praise you. We give you glory for the year that was, and we look forward to the year that is. May it be a year of opportunity, a chance for a fresh start, an opportunity to put some needed changes into our lives that draw us closer to you spiritually than we've ever been before. Lord, would this just be a year where, aside from all else, we develop an intimate relationship with you. Lord, we're not here to make New Year's resolutions. Lord, we are here to commit ourselves to living for you, heart, strength, soul, and mind. Lord, would you bless us? Would you guide us? Would you direct us? In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. So each year as we kick off, we often make New Year's resolutions, right? We're going to do something different. And then by like the end of January, we've already given up on all of those and nothing has changed. And we feel really guilty and we hate ourselves for not even being able to fulfill our resolutions. Can anybody relate to me today? You guys are, you're quiet, man. You're going to have to do better than this. I mean, first service was awake. You got an extra hour of sleep. Is anybody fired up? Come on, clap a little bit. Get excited. You're here. Or maybe you're just exhausted. Maybe you're one of those people that I was talking about a moment ago who might need a reboot. You're at that place where it seems that life's got you down and you just got through the holidays and you could barely get by. And the thought of going back to work now is like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I have to do this. Life has this way of wearing us down and keeping us so busy that we can hardly concentrate at times. If that's you, this message is especially for you. I believe some in this room are in desperate need of a reboot. Now, I wanted to start by giving a little bit of a history lesson, so to speak. Um, For those of you who are kind of geeky like me, this is going to be amazing. For those of you who are not, I'm sorry, Um, but it should be good. I hope you enjoy some of the analogies that will lead us up to this concept of a reboot. Maybe you've heard this phrase before. Maybe you work on computers as part of your living, as part of what you do, and the computer has malfunctioned a little bit. It hasn't worked the way that you want, and you call the IT department. They ask you a question every time you call them, have you? you done what yet? Rebooted, right? Seems so stupid. It seems crazy to think about, but there's a reality in it that when we do, it cleans things out. It empties the memory and it positions us to be able to receive. So I want to go back just a little bit further in history. Maybe some of you young people, you're going to be like, I can't believe these kinds of things actually existed. So, um, you know, there was a day and age before there was a cell phone, right? Do you know that? How many of y'all got cell phones? Pull them out if you got them. Come on, you're going to need them in a second. So how many of you got cell phones? A lot more of you have cell phones. You all are lying. You, you know, so we live by these things today. Sadly, they're like a tether to us, but there was life prior to a cell phone. In fact, growing up, I remember uh, my great-grandmother, I was, I was a child of a single mom, and we stayed with my great-grandma, and at her house, she was pretty poor, and she didn't even have a real, a real phone line, so to speak. Um, in fact, she had what maybe some of you have seen before. Does anybody know this dinosaur of a relic called a rotary phone, like you had to turn the dial, some of you. There's a video I saw recently, they put a rotary phone in front of a group of millennials and they were like, what, what? Like they couldn't figure out how this thing worked. And grandma actually could not afford the full phone line, so she had this thing called a party line. Does anybody know what that was? A few of you are raising your hands, right? So party line, like for a kid, was just awesome because you were actually sharing the phone line with your neighbor. So you could like pick up and try to be real quiet and listen to all their gossip and you could sit there and hear what was going on in their house. But you had to be courteous if you needed to make a phone call because you needed to share the phone with somebody else. 
Yes, life was quite different. At that day and age, they're also listed these now dinosaur things that are extinct. Thank you, Jesus, they're extinct. They were called the payphone. Does anybody remember the payphone, right? They were like the grossest things ever. You had to go pick up a phone and like just gum coming from it and it would be all gross, but yet you would still do it because your pager had gone off, right? And you had to go find a phone to be able to call somebody back on the cell. Y'all can relate to this. Some of you are young people are like, what the heck is he talking about? So you had to pay to use the phone, yeah? In fact, I remember, I think the year was right around 1990, the first cell phones started to become commercially available. The first one that I ever had was the Motorola brick phone. Come on. Anybody have a brick phone back in the day? Why was it called the brick phone? Because it weighed about as much as a brick, right? It was big, it was a brick. And man, you had to be a baller if you were to actually use it, right? Because you would have this phone and it would be like a status symbol, but it was like $1.50 a minute to talk on the phone. So somebody would be like, hey, can I borrow your phone? No way, I'm gonna go broke trying to use the phone. So it was $1.50 a minute. Now we got these unlimited plans. It's kind of crazy. How many of you actually use your phone to actually talk to people anymore? It's a rare art, right? I mean, barely we even talk on the phone from a voice perspective anymore. But that's what it was like back in those days. It was crazy how much has changed over all of these years. So much of it really technology-wise is a blessing. And at times there's a little bit of danger mixed in it that we'll explore in just a couple moments. But as I said, growing up, I was a really, really nerdy kid before I was adopted. My first name was Mr. McGee, or I'm sorry, Eric McGee, and they would call me Mr. Magoo. If anybody ever remembers that old comic, if not, look it up, search for Mr. Magoo, the big glasses. It was terrifying. It was terrifying. While other kids were out there playing in the soccer field and doing things like that, I was in my room coding, and it was crazy. It was a wonderful time. I grew up on this computer. It was called the Atari. Oh, my goodness. The Atari. That was what I, And then friends like mine who's in the front row, Christian Rischel, used to use a Commodore 64, or we affectionately called it the Commode 64 back in those days. And uh, we, we grew up on those kinds of things. It was crazy. I can still remember seeing the first Apple computer that had a mouse, and it was still black and white, but it was like the most magnificent thing that I had ever seen. I couldn't believe there was this new way of interacting with a computer as a kid. So back in the day, we had these things called five and a quarter inch floppy disks. Anybody remember those? Five and a quarter inch. You could put a notch on the other side and flip it over so that you could get double the data size. Come on, Jesus. These were the glory, glory days of computing. You'd have to put that in there in order to make it work. And I think of today where we've got these little USB keys that, man, can hold so much data. It is absolutely astounding, like literally thousands upon thousands of times the amount of data that those would hold. So how many of you are familiar with this new thing that apparently Al or invented called the internet. Does anybody know what the internet is? Has anybody experienced the internet? So the internet we take for granted today, don't we? I mean, we, we just, if it's a little bit slow, we're like, oh man, I can't believe my phone's so slow. I'm gonna come live with me out there in the country. You'll get what slow internet's all about in our day and age. But my first connection to this world that even predated the internet was this device called an acoustic coupler. It was a 300 baud modem that maybe none of you have ever seen before, but can you imagine? We used to take the phone handle off and put it inside of that little device so that we could use it to call other computers that predated the internet. That device didn't even have an auto answer feature. So to tell you what a big of a geek I was, they had diagrams where you could go to Radio Shack. Remember that place that no longer exists, Radio Shack? You go to Radio Shack and they had a kit so you could make a dialer that would auto answer that particular phone. These were the, glo these were the glory days, people. I'm here to tell you. These these are the glory days. I don't want to ever go back to them, but these are the glory days. So they had these things that was like, just opened up my life. It was incredible. It was called the bulletin board system, the bulletin board system. Can you, that was the internet, people. Some of you are like, what? what you, that was the internet. You could have a message board where you could communicate with other people. You could leave messages for other people via an email type of a thing. And then how many of you know, shortly after this came this beautiful sound as AOL came out. Remember that stuff? Like however that was, AOL. 
you young people are like, this stuff really existed? I mean, this stuff was for real. How much times have changed, how incredible it is this world that we live in today. It is nothing short of miraculous. In fact, what we call the information age that we live in today was actually prophesied in the Bible thousands of years ago. It said there'll come a day and age before Jesus would return where information will increase. We live in that day and age. It's amazing times that we live in. In fact, I believe a big milestone that's often forgotten occurred in 1998 when Google came online. Show an image of that one. This was Google's initial homepage. They haven't changed it all that much. Prior to that, do you know what the internet was? The Encyclopedia Britannica. The Encyclopedia Britannica. How many of you had one of those at your house, Encyclopedia Britannica? It had all the world's information at your fingertips if you could only lift it up. It was so big and so heavy that you couldn't even lift it up or pick. I mean, man, I would long for one of those today. But think about that for a second, though. Prior to Google, pretty much all of the world's information was stored in a, what was that, like 24-volume set? Along comes Google, and for the first time in human history, you could type any word, any phrase, anything that you could think of, and it's at your fingertips, and you'd get all this information back about it. We take this for granted today, that you could just Google it, right? We Google everything, and sometimes that's a great thing, other times maybe not so good of a thing. The world's information today is at our fingertips. I believe there's a big milestone and a change that occurred with this glorious device called the BlackBerry. Does anybody remember the BlackBerry? How many of you had a BlackBerry phone? Anybody had a BlackBerry phone? A few of y'all? The BlackBerry phone. What was the big distinguishing factor that the BlackBerry had? Email on your phone with a notification. So it started to turn us into, remember in school when they taught you about the Pavlov's dog experiment? They would put like press a buzzer and then every time the dog would respond, they'd give them food and the dog would be happy and it would keep going back and back and back for more. How many of you are like that with your notifications now today? Come on, be honest, right? The notification goes off like, bing, oh my God, I gotta go check who just texted me. The world's gonna come to an end if I don't figure out who texted me one moment ago and if they messaged me, oh no, they messaged me and now Facebook's so smart, I can tell if I open it and then if I open it, I gotta get back with them. This is is some of y'all's existence, is it not? I'm serious, right? They put this leash in this noose around us. So the BlackBerry was the first device to come up with a name after it that people started calling it. Does anybody remember what that was? The Crackberry. Come on, Jesus. Come on. It was like crack. You had to have it. You had to be there. You had to check it out. You had to see what these messages were. And believe it or not, the modern day cellular phone was only brought into existence in 2007 with the iPhone. Man, that's 11 years. Think about how much has changed. Now, I'll get real deep with you for just a moment. How many of y'all have iPhones? If you're an iPhone, hold it up, put your hand up, get it out if you've got one. I did this once a number of years ago. Flip it over if you don't have a case. What's on the back of it? Not just an apple, but what part of the apple? Young people, come on, Jesus. I see some young people. What's on the apple? What happened to the apple? There's a bite out of the apple. Let me just leave that there for you for one second. Some of y'all aren't getting it. Do you remember the book of Genesis? Oh, now I hear a lot of, ooh, ah, oh, wait, wait. There was this thing called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. What if the devil is just that bold? What if he's that bold? Just put it on there. You got the tree of knowledge of good and evil sitting right there and he puts it right on the device that we can't live without this device, that we're obsessed with this device. Yet there was another tree in the garden, that garden, you know, that tree of life that was there. That's the tree we should be getting shade under, the tree we should be hanging out under, the tree that truly brings us life. What if the dark side of some of these new technologies is that the devil's using them to keep us from what really matters? Keeping us at a place where we're addicted to these things, where we got to keep going back to them. Yet even in the midst of every new technology, God's always gracious to allow human beings to use them to advance the kingdom of God. In 2007, Apple introduced a new concept, which we take for granted also today, called the App Store. They opened it up with 200 apps. 
And amongst those apps was one called the U version of the Bible. It was the first Bible app, the first time people had a digital Bible in their hands that was easily and readily acceptable, you know, or accessible. So how amazing is that? So all of these things can be used as instruments for God's glory, but at the same time, they could lead us astray and point us in some wrong directions, right? That tree of knowledge of good and of evil. We know where things have gone from there. Today, everything's an app, is it not? Everything is an app. It's crazy to think about. I remember a picture. I couldn't find it for today, but there was a picture of all the stuff that our phone could do. Like if you had that in the 1980s, it would fill up an entire room, right? I mean, their video cameras back then were this big. They were gargantuan. Maybe there was this thing called the Walkman by Sony. Does anybody remember the Walkman by Sony? Those are just miraculous. First time they had made it a little bit more compact. Um, You have a GPS that's built in there that tells you where to go. You have all of these things inside of there. So in so many ways, it is truly and utterly miraculous. But at the same time, it's terrifying. I haven't even begun to talk about social media yet, have I? How has social media changed who we are as human beings? How addictive have these things become where we sit across tables with one another when we're supposed to be talking and we're looking at our phones and we're trying to tell the world about the dinner that we're having. Man, this Carabas is really good. Let me take a picture of this, uh, this spaghetti so that I could share it with the world, right? And oftentimes we're looking at those we love through the filter of a lens rather than looking at them face to face and communicating, right? We're all subject to this. There's beauty and there's terror mixed inside of these devices at the same time. So many ways we've grown to a place where we're addicted to them. We cannot live without them. I love my wife dearly, but there's one thing that she's done on occasion that drives me crazy. Maybe some of you have done this too. In our case, it seems to occur. We go down 103rd to get home. So we'll get on the highway. We'll get off on 103rd. We'll reach right about the Dairy Queen. There's a Dairy Queen about two, three blocks up there. Eric, I forgot my phone. Sorry. N- never happened to any of y'all? And of course, it's not like we're going home. You know what that means? Eric, we're going back to church. We got to go get that phone, right? So how many of you have done that? You have left your phone. You have to go back and get it. We can't live without these things, right? Or if it starts to run low on battery, how many of you just start to shake like you got Parkinson's or something? You're like... <laughs> Get me to Best Buy as quick as I can. I need to get a new cable so that I can get in there. These are truths. We've all experienced these things. That's why we laugh, right? There's truth that's mixed inside of them. What will some of these next iterations bring with artificial intelligence and robotics? Some really good stuff and also some pretty crazy stuff will probably come out of it. It's scary and amazing how these modern devices have often taken on God-like characteristics. We talk to our phones as if it were God. We say, okay, Google, or hello, Siri, or Alexa, or Alexa, shut up, Alexa. Would you stop, Alexa? (laughs) Here's your tweetable moment for the day. We often treat our devices more like God than we treat God. We ask them for directions to things when we don't even ask God for directions. How many of you remember the day and age where you used to have a map to be able to get around? A map. We use these things called people, kids. There was maps back in the day. You'd use a map and get around. And if you didn't follow the map, you'd get lost, right? You'd go in the wrong direction. Now we trust our phones more than we trust God. We ask Siri for answers to life when God wants us to get on our knees and say, Jesus, what should I do next? What's my next steps? Where would you have me go? We allow them to take on more God-like characteristics than we do even God, and they steal our time. We often pick these up to check our messages well before we ever spend any time with God in the morning, and we wonder why we're beat up. We wonder why we're in need of a reboot. We wonder why we're also drained, because we were wired as human beings to sit under the tree of life, to be rooted and grounded These things have literally rewired the way in which we think. Correct me if I'm wrong. But what I mean by that is our lives have so generated around these timelines like Facebook where we can't read beyond just the headlines anymore. 
God's word is meant to be just the opposite. What does it say about his word? It says we're to meditate on it day and night. We're to spend time with him. We're to pray. We're to just sit there and digest it and hang out with it. But for most of us, our Bible reading has come down to the verse of the day. Because that's what this technology is doing to us. So we need to put a leash on it and we need to be able to control it rather than it controlling us as we start the new year. Can I get an amen? It needs to be something that we need to change. Is it going to be easy? It's not going to be easy. I'm not here to give you an easy path. I'm here to speak the truth to you in love. And sadly, our children know no life or existence without this onslaught of technology. As much as I love it and much as I enjoy it, do you know people like Steve Jobs wouldn't even let his kids have a phone or any kind of technology? Some of the smartest minds in tech would not allow their kids to have tech because they knew what it's doing to them, right? Think about that for a moment. Steve Jobs, the guy who built Apple, would not allow his kids to even use a cell phone or technology at a young age. It's amazing to think about. But we serve a good and great God who wants to be in relationship with us. And sadly, oftentimes we have a more intimate relationship with our phones than we do with God, and there's something clearly wrong with that. But what if we were to take the month of January, really the next 21 days, to walk in a completely different way? You see, in many ways, we're all plugged into the matrix today, are we not? We all live in this fantasy world that's driven by the internet that overwhelms us at times. And we need to take that blue pill like in the matrix so that we could burst out of that to see life for what it was really created to be. God has a different plan and a different path for us. And the only way that we're going to get there is to reconnect with the God of the universe. And I'm telling you, the result of doing so will be much more joy in your life. See, if you're living by the Fox headlines every day, life is but a tragedy in Jesus' name, right? I mean, if you live by the headlines of the day, everything is doom and gloom all the time. There is a different way that's found in the tree of life. And God wants to recharge our batteries because he realizes that most of us are running on empty. Everybody's being real quiet, so I'm assuming that means you can relate to what I'm saying, right? So I told you I'm going to be very practical today. So I want to give you some tips. I want to give you some ideas. And for those of you who are part of Journey Church for some time, um, hopefully your address was correct and you received to your house a letter from Mary Jo and I a little bit earlier during the month of December where we talked about a, a guide to a spiritual guide to gr- a spiritual growth guide, right? And additionally, there was a prayer and fasting guide that was found within there. How many of you got those at your house? So if you're new to Journey and you did not get one and would like to get one, I want to encourage you after the service to stop by our next step station. They'd love to give you one because I'm telling you there's 11 steps that are found in there that are not world breakers. They're all very common. They're all very known. But if applied in your life, like those old maps that we used to have print out, if we follow those steps, we will get to our God-given destination. There's simple things in there that we all know, like you're practicing today. Come to church on a regular basis, fellowship with other believers. How cool is it? How awesome is it when we're worshiping with other believers? Maybe first service a little more than you guys. I don't know. You're a little weird in here. But um, how amazing is it when we're hearing Wendy sing of the glories of God or Adam or the others who are up there and it draws us directly into his presence? That's part of what we need to recharge. You see, as much advances that they've made in technology, they still got to recharge a battery every single day. Have you noticed that? If not multiple times a day, right? It's meant to be that way because we're meant to recharge and connect at least on a daily basis. We need to plug in, right? That means that we should be spending time with God on a daily basis. There's other things that God wired us to do, like be in community where we should get involved in a small group and be connected. So the stuff I'm speaking to you is not unknown to you. If you've been around church any length of time, you know these things. The blessing is in the doing of these things that will change your life, right? I don't want you to just resolve to do them. Just start doing them. And I, I promise you, as the blessing comes, you will be more and more inclined to spend more time with God and enjoy those things on a regular basis. Can I get an amen to that? But I suspect many in this room are at a place of drifting, that place of burnout. I want to just say to you, you weren't created to just hang in there like a monkey on a branch. You are created to thrive. 
So where are we going to go in the weeks ahead? Next weekend, I'm going to teach from what Adam shared a little bit earlier in Luke 11, 1. Lord, teach us to pray. You see, I've been praying for over 25 years, and there's a lot that I learned about prayer, and there's a lot that I don't know. And what I realized is that there's always room to grow. Man, I want to get closer to God just as his disciples asked him, Lord, teach me how to pray. I want to learn what it means to be an intercessor. I want to learn how I can take victory for my family, how I can bind and loose things in spiritual places. I want to learn how I can grow into a more intimate relationship with God simply by communicating with him. And if your intimacy is lost, I'm here to tell you it can be regained because the Bible says those who seek him will find him. I think the problem is we haven't been doing much seeking because we're playing around with this other God all the time. Right? Uh Uh-oh, it got quiet in here again. I'm in trouble. (laughs) We'll build on that with stories like the wise young virgins whose lamps were full of oil. They were ready. We'll talk about encountering and walking in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to build on this concept starting today about the lost art of fasting. Let's talk about that for a minute. What are some of the things I'm going to tangibly do differently over the next 21 days starting tomorrow? Let me start by laying out a goal for us corporately and encourage you to make one for yourself personally. The primary objective of the fasting time is for us to gain a greater level of intimacy with God as we start the new year. I'm going to spend a few moments explaining that. What do I mean by it? Why should we fast? Is it something that Christians do? Because it's something that's so foreign to us in our day and age where there's restaurants that abound around us where we can go to any fast food place we want and get food in five minutes. We don't know what it means not to have our bellies full. I've heard so many people saying, including myself, I'm starving to death. You ever said that? Come on. I've seen children eating from a garbage dump fighting vultures for their food for the day. In America, we do not know what it means to be starving to death. We all need to abstain from food for spiritual purposes for a short period of time so that we could empty ourselves out, so that we could be filled up with the goodness and glory of God. We're so full here in America all the time, so overstuffed all the time that there's no room for God to put anything in. I see a lot of head shaking. It must be making sense today. So how do we get there? How do we develop this greater level of intimacy? I love Paul's prayer for the Ephesians. I'm going to pray it over you today. Ephesians 3.14. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through your spirit to your innermost being. That's what God wants for you. He doesn't want you to walk around defeated. He wants you to walk around in power and anointing to experience him to your innermost being. How many of you want that in your life? Like five of you. Oh, no, we are in deep trouble today. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That's my prayer for you, that you would be filled with the fullness of God, that you would experience him to the fullest, that you would have an intimate relationship with him, that it would transform your thoughts, that it would transform your life, that you would have a life filled with joy and peace and freedom, not one that's bound by the tree of knowledge of good and evil that's trying to keep us down all the time. That is not the calling that is on your life in Jesus' name. To accomplish that, historically, God has put his people through a season of fasting. Fasting simply defined means abstaining from food for a spiritual purpose. Abstaining from food for a spiritual purpose. You say, Eric, I've never had a pastor tell me that I should be fasting. Well, let me be the first one to tell you that we should be fasting. You see, it says in places like Matthew chapter 6, it doesn't say If you fast, if you pray, and if you give, it says when you fast, when you pray, and when you give, right? These are supposed to be, that's why I say it's a lost art, these are supposed to be part of our everyday ordinary experience as believers in Jesus Christ. 
that we would enter into these seasons like this on a somewhat regular basis so that we could grow in our spiritual connection with God. There's things that he could do only when we're willing to do that. Mark 2.19 says, And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. Jesus has been taken away from us from this earth. He is now sitting in heaven. We are here. We are the people that he's speaking to, saying they should fast, right? So if this hasn't been part of your spiritual experience, I want to encourage you to enter into it. And we're not sharing these things with you to make you feel guilty, I promise you. And I'll give some examples in just a moment. We are sharing these things to build you up because we want to see you thrive. See, the discipline of fasting that we're all called to has a way of releasing the anointing, the favor, and the blessing of God on the life of a Christian. Do you want the favor, the anointing, and blessing of God in your life? Man, you guys are rough today. I'm here to tell you. Do you want the favor, anointing, and blessing of God in your life? So inevitably, here's one of the first questions that comes up. Eric, instead of fasting, so instead of abstaining from food, can I fast from Facebook or something like that? It's a good thing, but it's not fasting. There's a lot of good things. Let me describe to you. So it may be a very good thing, but there's a difference between fasting and abstinence, right? So abstinence could be a very good thing. If you're a single young man or woman, you don't think abstinence is a very good thing as it pertains to sex, do you, right? Why y'all laughing, right? But there's glory in that to give God the glory for those who have abstained in that area of life. When they enter into the wedding relationship, they have a greater level of intimacy than those who have never done that can ever experience. It's a beautiful gift from God that is a good and great thing. So they abstain from sex before they are married so that they could give glory to the God in whom they worship Remember, there's always two sides to idolatry. Doing the opposite means you are worshiping another God of your own choosing, right? For me, another example, I am a drug addict alcoholic, right? That was my nature in my sinful fallen nature. Today, I'm a grateful recovered alcoholic. I choose to abstain from alcohol as an act of worship to my God and King because for me to do otherwise is a sin. For you to drink if you're not an alcoholic may not be a sin, but for me it is. So I choose to abstain from that which seems natural to my flesh because I want to bring God glory in an area that's difficult and troubling to me. Does that make sense? Your area may be different, and during this 21-day season, you may want to abstain from whatever seems natural to your flesh as an act of worship unto God, but I want to tell you, you're not going to receive the full benefit of it unless you're willing to abstain from food also. Disclaimer here, if you have a medical condition that prevents you from doing so, no problem. And I'm not here to tell you, like you might be freaking out. I see all these freaked out looks. Eric, you're telling me I'm not going to eat for 21 days? I eat three times a day. That means 60 uh, plus 20. Th- uh, I'm not going to eat 64 meals. Are you crazy? What are you even talking about? Can I tell you something? I've been through a few 21 day seasons of prayer and fasting, and I've never made it through an entire 21 day season of prayer and fasting. Do I feel guilty about it? No. <laughs> Why? Because each time I do it, I want to build towards something greater. I'm asking the Lord to release something more in me, and I've always gotten a beautiful spiritual benefit. So here's what I would share with you. Take it as a starting point when it comes to food abstinence, right? So maybe if you've never done a fast before, you skip breakfast one day and spend that time that you would have done eating breakfast with God. By lunchtime, you'll be like, I am dying. I am starving. No, you are not. You will be absolutely okay, right? Skip breakfast. Spend that time with God. Then maybe the next day, okay, I survived that, right? Then the next day, skip breakfast and lunch. And then when you hit dinner, don't be making up doing double time out there eating everything else, right? I mean, like, just have a normal dinner. It's not the makeup game afterwards to try to do it, right? 
spend time for breakfast and lunch. And then, hey, I, I accomplished that. Lord, thank you for giving me the grace to do that. And then maybe you jump into a 24-hour fast, right? And then after that, if you feel so led, do two days or three days or however long the Lord should tarry to do a complete 21-day fast with water only or as I know only a handful of people, one who was here in the first service who did a 40-day fast with water only, you better be called to that. That's not something that you can just do in the natural. To do that, there's a supernatural calling. In fact, one person that I know, after they did the 40 days, they're like, I am never fasting again. <laughs> I kind of don't blame them, right? That's a supernatural anointing. But who knows, maybe that's what God wants for you. Ask him on a daily basis, Lord, help me. I want to go deeper. I want to know you more. I want to be poured out of these things of the world so that you can fill me up by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to know the fullness of God. I want to have that intimacy, as Eric was describing, between a husband and a wife with you and I. I want to know what that means, and I've never experienced it before. Lord, would you allow me into that place, and he will meet you in that place, and you'll never experience life the same way ever again after that. I want to encourage you to just take one step more, dive deeper and deeper and deeper during the course of these 21 days. Pray like you've never done before. If you have a phone, ditch it for a few moments and stick it in another room. Put it somewhere where you could go a little bit old school and pick up the Bible so that you're not distracted. I don't know about you, but I'll pick up my Bible and I'll start to read on the phone and all of a sudden, ding, ooh, ooh, I start shaking again, right? Who texted me? Who texted me? Was it a Facebook message? I gotta read, I gotta read, oh, I gotta read. I feel obligated. Nobody's like me, I'm sorry, I, mean, I do have issues. So it distracts me sometimes to read the Bible on technology. I can't spend time meditating on it. So maybe if that's a problem for you, go put it in a different place, get in a room where you're isolated. So in the weeks ahead, we're gonna build on this. We're gonna talk about how we can pray. How do we go deeper? There's resources that you could find online. If you got the Spiritual Growth Starter Pack and Fasting Guide, there's a daily prayer for each day that you can go out there and uh, use. Um, there's also online in our Facebook page. We're gonna be posting that every single day. This afternoon, there is a link to a version plan by Jensen Franklin on a 21-day spiritual devotional uh, directly pertaining to fasting. So maybe you'll choose to do that 21-day devotional during that time where you're plugging in and going a little bit deeper. My heart here is not to guilt anybody. Do you hear my heart? Don't feel guilty if you mess up. Guess what? Just the next day, pick it up. There's new blessings every morning. Hey, I'm going to try again. I messed up. I was hungry. I ate. That's not what it's about, right? It's about spending time with your God and King, Man, I promise you that if you do, you will experience joy and peace that you've never had before. In Jesus' name, can I get an amen? amen. Rise with me, bow your heads, and close your eyes today. Hallelujah. Father, the things I'm sharing today are simple but not easy. Like most of life, it is that way. We know what we should do. But like that weird phenomenon where Chick-fil-A comes calling on Sundays when it's closed, <laughs> our flesh just wants to do things that are not what we want them to do, but we so easily fall into those temptations. And Lord, we come before you today in humility, maybe gaining some new insight and knowledge from this concept of rebooting and from technology. May we look and gaze at these devices that encircle and surround us in so many ways today in a different light today. Not that they're necessarily evil in any way, shape, or form, but that we could treat them as tools, that these things would not control us, but we would have control over them. And sometimes the only way we can regain that control is through a reboot, through a season of abstinence or a season of fasting where we can recontemplate, recalibrate, and seek you Lord, we've been living in the spiritual doldrums for so long. We need a fresh wind of the Holy Spirit to blow through our lives and take us to the places that you would have us go. So during these next 21 days, would it be a season of pouring out so that you might pour into our lives? I want to pray for some people today, and I don't want to embarrass you in any way shape or form, but I do want to pray for you and people around you will celebrate with you. But 
if you're in that place right now where you know you need a reboot, these things that I'm telling you about today, they're, they're nothing new. They're already on your heart and your mind. You've been longing for this. You're praying for the strength to move through it during these next 21 day season because you know that this year cannot go on in the same way as maybe last year or some of the previous years did. You are ready for something new. If that's you, would you just raise your hand up real high right where you're at? I see so many all throughout this place today. Thank you for your faithfulness and your courage in raising up your hands. There might be still others where you, won't, you don't call yourself a Christian. You, you, you wouldn't call yourself a believer, but you've walked through these doors this morning, and you just feel the love and presence of God. And today's a day where you know, I've got to dedicate my life to Christ. I've got to dedicate myself to this cause that Eric is speaking about. I want to live in the tree of life and not the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Or maybe you are a believer. I believe your salvation is secure. You can't lose that once you're saved. You're saved, but you need to rededicate your life today because other things have filled up your memory banks, and it's time to clear them out and say, from this day forward, I'm going to live for my God and my King and Him alone. If that's you, would you do me a favor and raise your hand up really high as well? I see yours and yours. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Father, I pray for all who raised their hands today. We rejoice with them this morning as we come before you and so many are in need of a reboot or refresh and so many who are here maybe didn't even have the strength to lift up their hand today because they're so beaten down. Lord, even after first service, I saw tears flowing from people's hearts and minds as they just came to the realization that they so desperately need this. And I pray if that's what's needed, you would do it in our hearts and in our minds today. Devil, you are a liar. You have no place over the people of Journey Church. You do nothing to speak life. You do nothing but speak lies. And we speak nothing but life into the people of Journey Church this very day. Lord, pour us out so that we might be full of you. Father, we make a commitment today, some for the first time, others as a means of renewal by saying, Jesus, you are the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again that we might have life and we might have it more abundantly. And from this day forward, we will live our lives for you and for you alone. Lord, we love you. Take our sins as we lay them at your feet. We don't want to live that way anymore. We need your help. Holy Spirit, be our guide, be our comforter, be our director. Thank you, Jesus, that your blood was shed, that we might have freedom and forgiveness. We walk from this place this very morning victorious, knowing that you are with us, committed to living a God-first life of putting you first in everything that we do. We love you, we praise you, and we give you glory today in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. Be sure to stop by our partners who are in the back. They'd love to help you kickstart your health. If you're new, come on up and say hello. I'd love to meet you personally.